now that we have the voices of our entire city and across the nation, we want to give, we want to make sure that that's heard and we want to make sure that that's clear. We want to give you guys opportunity to get your message across and, and, and push the things that you guys have been working so hard to end. It's valuable, it's valid, and I'm here to support every single one of the people that are in this room that have been fighting against the oppression of the people that we have put in places of power continue to push on us. And I just want to make that clear. I mean, I'm going to be sure that there is. I mean, sir. Come on. All, all due respect, can you focus on the issue and talk to the mayor and go through that and we can have our conversation afterwards? I, of course. Yes, of course. I don't want to embarrass you. Well, we were, and that was what I just want to stay on topic. What we demanded from this meeting was to create a conduit for change. For the mayor to hear our, to hear our demands, we would like the community to start speaking about those demands. May I, share, may I share the demands that the folks Absolutely. outside have? Do you want me to read them? Or you got them? Uh, so I just want to first say, I don't necessarily believe that this meeting would have been open had there not been thousands of people gathered and a lot of community pressure from a lot of people to make this meeting accessible uh, to a lot of folks. And I said I would only attend if we could live stream because uh, Everybody deserves to know how these meetings go. They affect everyone, not just in Seattle, but in our region. So the folks that are outside have gathered around three key demands, but there are other demands that will be released later this week in partnership with other communities, including the Africa Town Community Land Trust, uh, Community Passageways, Rainier Beach Action Coalition, are all organizations that we partner with. So the three for today are we would like to see the police begin to defund. We're asking for 50% of the budget. Uh, we have at least a $300 million shortfall mm -hmm. due to COVID-19, and the police have an exorbitant amount of money that does not necessarily benefit <clears throat> black and brown communities. In fact, it criminalizes us most often, and criminalization leads to poverty. Poverty leads to having to make choices uh, that are often criminalized. Our second demand is that that money be moved directly into investments for black and brown communities. Um, we have created plans. We have grassroots movements that are responding to public safety, that are responding to uh, the need for healing in our, our neighborhoods, responding to the need for economic development. Black folks have experienced an immense amount of wealth stolen from us, not just in present day, but in past day. If we were to be paid reparations from the time of enslavement, we would be owed an obscene amount of money and probably be doing much better in this nation than we are now. Our third demand is there are quite a few people from the protests over the last six days that are still incarcerated, some of whom have not received the appropriate hearings and the opportunity to make bail. Uh, we want to see those people released. We've heard it recognized multiple times that uh, the protests have been said to be mostly peaceful despite the excessive abuse of force um, on protesters. And so we ask that those people be demand. We would attach to that that in the midst of a global pandemic, COVID-19 is going to spread very rapidly through our, our jails and the Department of Corrections. What the city of Seattle can impact is the King County Jail and the Regional Justice Center. And we ask that there be faster attempts made to expedite the release of folks so that we can stop the spread of COVID inside. Um, and I wanna say that if we want to ensure that people in the streets are better able to protect themselves, we will start to make concise, quick action <clears throat> on these in order to ensure that people feel they can spend more time at home. But so long as the bureaucracy continues to be bureaucracy, people are gonna feel the need to stay in the streets. And so uh, it's very important for that. I would also say maybe demilitarize the police because when they come out in riot gear like they have, it escalates the situation. It pushes people to limits, people who are dealing with trauma and a lot of uh, generational pain and we don't need to exasperate that. So let me just say this uh, before we all start. This is very important that I say this because we all operate with different tentacles in order to come off the system in different ways. Each of us need to be operating in our genius, but you know, one does this, one does this, one does this. Now that's how the system operates without us 
So that's how we get all the way to them. But there's a key fundamental point that I want to say before we get started. The same thing I was saying when we built the Escalation Washington and the largest coalition of people of color in, this, in the history of this city. That I don't have to agree with, with someone 100% of the time in order to deal with them. If we don't put that at the forefront, then that's where feelings get involved and things of that nature. We need to find out where we agree, right? Um, let me just say, we do what we call conversations with the streets, where we bring professional leaders from all, professionals and leaders, black leaders from all over the country to Seattle to engage our youth and our people here. And the way I get people who are Pan-Africans and Muslims and Christians is that I say to him, them, leave your ideology at home, right? The system has learned how to use ideology to separate us. So leave your ideology at home and let's build on black love, black unity, and the reclaiming of our youth. And I think every one of us can agree on at least that. That would be a great starting point, right? So um, uh, I, I can agree with Nikita on some things, but I know that the way this country is set up with power and force, the way it has, uh, you know, empires throughout history have conquered lands and peoples. That's what they do. America is an empire that have also conquered lands and people, right? And they're not going to give up any sense of power when it comes down to uh, their military, uh, and their law enforcement. There are other ways we can do that. Uh, the way I think we should do it is I'm not in the position that I want to ask for anything. I want to build power so that we can demand it. I want to build power. And that word building power is not something that's really relative spoken in our communities, right? But it's important for me and for us, well, let me just talk about myself because like I said, people move differently. So um, the way we got the police accountability law here is that I went to other communities that have suffered, like black communities, right? And said so they've been whooping the hell out of us, we need to come together. Because they can beat us individually, but they can't beat us together, right? So that's building power. So it's not just me coming at it, we got Asians, and, 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 and uh, Samoans, and uh, Latinos, and Natives, and black people all working together on this relative understanding of police accountability. So, and when you build power, and you include unions, <coughs> And folks that really want to help that don't know how to help though, like union people being involved because uh, uh, they're union people and labor is down about change. So just trying to build that power so that when I come before a mayor or a governor, I'm coming with that power. So when we built 940, we weren't asking nothing. We demanded it, right? And we had the power on the people on our side because we took two years educating the people about policy and legislation and how you get change. Marching is great. All these people out here, that is, that's great. We've done that with Black Lives Matter. But there was never no policy and legislation connected to the marches. Anytime MLK marches, it was always connected to policy and legislation. Because what will end up happening is we have the enthusiasm of thousands of people that we have not funneled into real change and we lose that enthusiasm. Because at the end of a year or two of marching, People are going to say, well, what has happened? Nothing. <clears throat> what has happened in 50 years? Nothing. So we're going to have to start going at this thing a little different. And so that's what I've tried to do, and we've had some successes in it, and we will continue to build upon those successes. Right now, what I'm doing that now is um, creating another event that's called Next Steps. Because we need to know what the next steps are. So all those thousands of people out there, oh, that's great. <clears throat> But we need to bring them in, educate them uh, about the impediments to change in our city and state. Who's doing that? How is Spog doing that, right? And we need to, we need to uh, educate our community about what that looks like so they can be empowered when we go in face of Spog and all these other little things that have been impediments for change for years. 